So good morning, good morning, everybody. Uh, so this session, which is the last one in this symposium, is uh, dedicated to neuroscience, which is one of the uh, priorities in terms of increasing the capacity building uh, in Fiocruz due to the needs of developing neuroscience for health. Um, we got in this um, in this round table, people from Fiocruz and people from Pasteur and people from outside, um, particularly Juan Samoli, who is chairing the session with me from the University Pierre Marie Curie in France, with whom we also developing things, including in neuroscience, Siddhartha Ribeiro um, from the Federal University of uh, Rio Grande do Norte, with accent. <laughs> Uh, that will also strongly collaborate in this forge of the uh, Neuroscience uh, Institute here at Fiocruz. Okay, so thank you, Savino, for inviting me for this meeting. So I'm not Pasteur, I'm not Fiocruz, although between Pierre and Marie Curie and Fiocruz, there has been a long-lasting collaboration uh, over 10 years now on the common laboratories, common structure. I'm really happy to see that's this sort of common structure is extending to other bodies in France, and I'm sure that if we work together, we should arrive to something really constructive. So I'm really happy to see that session on neurogenesis, which is really in the interest of the university I belong to, but which is also really in the interest of Pasteur and, of course, of Fiocruz and the future of Fiocruz. Okay, so the first speaker uh, um, is Cecilia Edin Pereira. Uh, now a specialist within the few crew staff, and she's going to speak about neurogenesis and gliogenesis during development and disease. So with these 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, tell you uh, a little bit of what goes on in the lab. So it's, it's going to be very little. And uh, I chose like two uh, main lines of research to tell you about. Um, which, which tells a little bit more about my history as a neuroscientist. So I'm uh, originally a developmental neuroscientist and interested in uh, proliferation, mechanisms of migration, differentiation, and circuit formation in the developing brain. And uh, we came upon, um, uh, during uh, experiments that we, we, we made, looking for the creation of a, a tissue uh, in the culture that could keep the characteristics of the uh, neural tissue. And we came upon these cells in uh, the marginal zone. So, so typically we have proliferation going on in the ventricular zone, right? So here we have the ventricles and a developing brain. And so a proliferation, uh, it, it's known that proliferation uh, happens mostly in this periventricular uh, region and that cells uh, come out of this region and migrate over uh, radial glial cells and establish themselves in uh, layers um, in the cerebral cortex. What we found was um, there were cells in the surface of the cortex which is called uh, in, in embryonically the marginal zone and becomes layer one uh, in cerebral cortex later on, that these cells here were able to proliferate. So we uh, investigated, sorry about the, the quality, because uh, in my computer it looks great, but here found was that uh, at the surface of the brain uh, we have proliferating cells, which we looked at uh, with BRDU and also with the a marker of uh, mitosis so as to be sure that the whole process, the whole si cell cycle was happening in one. And what we found is that th these numbers grew towards the end of uh, gestation. And uh, analyzing the uh, phenotypical diversity of these clones, um, we found that uh, they were quite different from the the clones, uh, progenitor clones in the ventricular zone, ventricular and subventricular zone, uh, in which uh, in, during embryogenesis, 
in the ventricular zone, you have the production mainly of neurons. So you have pure glial clones. And then you have some mixed clones as well, uh, which produce neuron and, neurons and glia. And then we have a, a, a short, uh, a, a small percentage that actually have uh, pure glial uh, clones. So what we found in the marginal zone was that, well, there actually was a proliferative niche and it did produce uh, neurons in a, a smaller number at the same time, but mostly it produced uh, glial cells and it had uh, this uh, feature of having a, 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 an enormous amount of pure glial clones. And uh, we also found some mixed clones. So we did find in uh, the marginal zone that you really have a neurogenic and gliogenic niche uh, during embryogenesis. So we also studied other features of, this, um, of these cells and what we found was uh, that uh, they, they also differed in, in, in the number of neurons and of glia, glial cells that they produced. And so uh, marginal zone cells, for example, were uh, good, very good in producing glial cells, not so good uh, uh, ventricular zone was not so good uh, at doing that, whereas the opposite was true for uh, production of neurons, right? So the pure neuronal clones were uh, produced less, less neurons in the MZ than the VZ, uh, SVZ. Anyhow, uh, we found that uh, the marginal zone was a new niche for neurogenesis and gliogenesis. And we had done several years before a uh, study with uh, human brains, and actually I, I brought this because it was done in collaboration with, um, with a hospital in Fiocruz called uh, Fernandes Figueira, and, uh, where, where we, we were able to get some fetus, fetuses uh, from human brain fetuses. And we, we studied, we, we looked at the, uh, we were looking at the transformation of radioglial cells into astrocytes uh, using dye that was uh, placed in the surface of the brain. It's a carbocyanin that goes, uh, diffuses through the lipids. And then uh, we found, so, so we were looking at the, this differenti differentiation process, and we found that um, besides the transforming figures that were already, that had already been shown uh, in, uh, in, in rodents and, and primates, non-human primates, that uh, we also had this process uh, of uh, transformation of radioglia into astrocytes with the loss of the ventricular uh, attachment. But we also found that uh, a new population of astrocytes appeared in the surface of the cortex, which quite distant from this, uh, fr from this site, and that did not, have, uh, did not seem to, to have an, a glial origin. I'm not going to show this, uh, these data. They're, they're published a long time ago, but it's just to tell you that most probably uh, human cerebral cortex may have astrocytes, surface astrocytes that are coming from uh, uh, marginal zone progenitors. Well, uh, we also study in the lab neurogenesis in the subventricular zone and uh, mechanisms regulating migration of uh, neurons to the olfactory bulb. But uh, what I'm going to tell you about is uh, um, uh, some work that we did looking at uh, gliogenesis in the subventricular zone, and particularly uh, oligodendrogenesis. So, oops. so the model we chose was uh, a model in which uh, we, we were looking to see the capacity of regeneration of uh, myelin in, um, in mice, uh, in, in a depression model. And we found that it was very difficult to depress mice. Uh, mice don't uh, depress with the, with the um, same strategies that you have, that, that you apply to rats, for example. So we were having some trouble in the lab and I had a student that came from a behavior background. And I was a little bit like, well, if we have to stress uh, these animals to, to rise, to make their corticosterone rise, why don't we uh, give them corticosterone? So we did that. And so 
uh, as you see here, uh, the, the social isol isolation and stress are important uh, regulators of neurogenesis, and uh, they produce, for example, decrease in neurogenesis uh, in um, hippocampus, as well as social I isolation does the same. So we actually, uh, based on the idea, based on the idea that uh, stress is one of the, oops, stress is one of the important uh, uh, causes, factors, etiological factors for uh, depression, we decided then to uh, use this um, and, and associate, sorry, and associate uh, the corticosterone, um, the corticosterone application or uh, to social isolation. So it was known that um, there, there, it was known from a lot of human post-mortem uh, studies that uh, white matter deficits uh, were uh, found in, in depression. So there was, it was known that uh, there was damage to myelin and reduction of oligodendrocytes in human post-mortem and uh, evidence that myelin basic protein, NBP, uh, is decreased in, uh, uh, in depressive patients. And there was a strong correlation between psychiatric diseases and white matter uh, um, um, perturbation, suggesting that they might be involved in, in some pathological aspects of these illnesses. So as you know, oligodendrocytes and myelin, um, uh, oligodendrocytes are uh, the cells that make the myelin sheets that uh, encircle the axons. And uh, lately, there's a lot of data showing that uh, this, which we thought was a fixed, uh, that, that this myelin was quite immutable, that there is a lot of plasticity going on, and that you can have demyelination and myelination going on uh, all the time, so it's, it's fairly dynamic, uh, which means that maybe axons can sprout collaterals and this kind of thing, uh, and that probably oligodendrocytes and myelin play uh, an important role also in plasticity. Um, we know that uh, there are progenitors in the subventricular zone that give rise to um, the progenitors that, uh, intermediate progenitors that give out uh, oligodendrocytes. So you actually have uh, progenitors from the SVZ that migrate to the white matter and become oligodendrocyte progenitors. Uh, ready to uh, remyelinate uh, axons that have been uh, destroyed. And so what we wanted to investigate was whether uh, myelin and oligodendrogenesis were somehow affected in an adult model, uh, a mice adult model of depression. So our paradigm was simple. Uh, we actually, so after going through a lot of different strategies, we came up with um, giving animals corticosterone in drinking water and uh, maintaining them isolated. And that the combination of these two uh, actually was um, sufficient to, to give uh, the behavioral, the typical behavior for depression, which was measured by uh, for swimming tests and preference for sucrose. So we found that the immobility in the forest uh, swimming test increased in our experimental animals, and that also we had a difference in the preference for sucrose, indicating that some of the uh, characteristics for uh, depression were achieved. We also look at levels of serotonin and dopamine. Both were decreased, uh, as we would expect in a, a depression model. And uh, fluoxetine recovered, uh, reverts the effect of cortical iso uh, isolation in uh, the first swimming test. So we, we then looked at the subventricular zone and we found that actually there was an increase uh, in, uh, in proliferation in the subventricular zone. So we thought, oh, well, so depression increases the production of oligodendrocytes. But then uh, uh, we found that that was not true, that there was a decrease uh, a, a strong uh, decrease of oligodendrogenesis in the sense that we had 
um, the progenitors that were positive for BRTU and OLIG2, a marker of the oligodendrocyte lineage, were reduced in the white matter. Um, Okay, so we also found that, this, that, that there were decreases of, of myelin, uh, uh, myelin basic protein was decreased in the depression model, and that uh, there was a decrease in the number of myelinated axons uh, in, in this model, and also the G ratio that uh, correlates the, the uh, perimeter of the axon to the perimeter of myelin was, uh, was altered uh, mainly in this uh, in 0 0.7, 0 0.8 ratio, which is typical of the corpus callosum where we uh, did these measurements. So uh, in conclusion, uh, what was shown by the postmortem uh, tissue in humans, uh, we found that uh, similarly there's a dramatic uh, uh, decrease, there, there's damage to myelin, and a dramatic decrease in oligodendrogenesis. So, uh, we finish here. Uh, and uh, these are all, all the people that have been working in this, but especially uh, Babette Fuss, which is a collaborator from VCU uh, in the United States, and Luciana Nogaroli is an oligodendrocyte specialist. And here's the, the main person, Ana Claudia, which did all the behavioral work and, uh, and which came up with this project uh, to start with. So, thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to, to the organizers. I'm, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Thanks to the organizers and also to, to the speakers. I've learned a lot of stuff during these two days. So, thanks also, also to the speakers. Uh, today, I'm going to present uh, some general topics of the lab regarding adult neurogenesis and how I can try to present how we're trying to bind and bridge the gap between neuron and behavior, between neuron and cognition. Because at the end we have, we're studying neurons, but the, object, the, the main uh, role of the brain is to drive our behaviors and to drive our representation. So the objective of the lab is really to bridge the gap between what a cell is doing to the behavior. Uh, and regarding that, we have focused a lot on a particular process, which is adult neurogenesis. As already alluded by uh, Cecilia just before, there was a dogma for a long time saying that when you are, an adult, uh, when you are adult, you have a, a fixed number of neurons, and each time you lose some neurons, it's for the rest of your life. This is not exactly true. Uh, it's not true in two parts of the brain, which is the hippocampus here and the ventricle olfactory system. Uh, why? Because uh, in particular in the ventricle here, which are these uh, uh, edric uh, structures in the pocket within the brain, you have stem cells. Stem cells that are able to generate immature neurons. And these immature neurons, so stem cells that proliferate here, immature neurons that migrate for several millimeters, several millimeters for a neuron, it's a long trick, a long trip, and up to the olfactory bulb, which is the first relay center of the olfactory system. And there, they are differentiating and integrating. And they mainly differentiate into gabergic interneurons called granules. So I have to rapidly explain you what is the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb is the first relay center of the olfactory system. Basically, when you have uh, a molecule that is detected in the nose, you have sensory neurons in your nasal cavity that is transducing the presence of a molecule into an electrical signal. This signal is then sent to the structure, the olfactory bulb. Information is transmitted via projection neurons to the cortex. But before being transmitted, you have an army of neurons, gabergic cells, granule cells, that are shaping, reformatting this information before the information being set, sent to the olfactory cortex. And within this red cells, granule cells, you have a small subpopulation of cells that are generated in the adult. They represent 5 to 10 percent. And to give you a different view of this process, uh, here's a picture done by my colleague. You have here the ventricle side here. You can guess, it's difficult to hear the, the, the olfactory bulb. 
And what my colleague did is infected the stem cells with a, a GFP and take sagittal slices of the, of, the, of the mouse brain, put it in a confocal and take pictures for 12, 12 hours. And what you can barely see, it's kind of difficult on, on this picture, but you can see cells that are migrating, thank you very much, on, on this kind of highway here, up to the bulb here, where they start to differentiate. And what is striking from this video is that first of all, you see that all these cells, they migrate in that direction, they don't go here, they don't go here, they all are attracted by this structure. And when they are here, they start to migrate and integrate different, different parts of the ball. So when you see this picture like that, you, the first question that came out for us is, why do the brain spend so much energy to produce neurons and feed the olfactory bulb with new neurons? What is the function of these guys? What are, what are they doing in, in, the, in the circuit? And so to answer this question, uh, well, maybe r rapidly uh, before going to function. What we first did uh, to characterize this system is to, okay, let's see what are the different steps of maturation of a neuron within a, a circuit. And as soon as the neuron arrives in the olfactory bone, they switch from a migratory uh, morphology to a slowly uh, mature neuron which extends and bend right and form these synapse. Synapses are the little connection between neurons. And along with this morphological maturation, you have a lot of functional maturation, uh, ranging from morphology, but also creation of synapse. Synapse can be excitatory or inhibitory in the brain. And also you have uh, not only uh, formation of synapse, but also uh, formation of, of uh, properties within synapse. One properties that have been uh, the focus of the lab uh, in 2009 was uh, the property called long-term potentiation. This is uh, a big name for a simple feature. It, this is the persistent strengthening of a synapse after stimulation. Imagine you have a neuron receiving some inputs. Each time you stimulate those inputs, you'll see the synapse that will be activated. And in fact, this activation persists during time, for hours, for days, even for months. And this, is, this persistent activity is thought to be the basis of memory. Each time you memorize something, in fact, you enhance the connectivity between neurons through this persistent long-term potentiation. And to our surprise, we observed that this feature is in the, in the olfactory system, in the olfactory bulb, is selective, is specific to these adult brown neurons. And as soon as they mature, as soon as they become more and more like the pre-existing neurons, they lose this property. So it's really when you are young, you have a, when you are young neurons, that you are able to strengthen your inputs and be and bark in a general memory process. So uh, from the functional point of view, the, the second question we wanted to ask in the lab is, okay, what is the function of these neurons, adult-born neurons? To, one way to do that, in biology, to, co to, to, make, to create a causal link between a neuron and a, and a, and a behavior, or in biology, to, to make a causal link between a, a molecular process, a cellular process, and a function, there is two aspects, two, two strategies. Loss of function or gain of function. So we did a bit of loss of functions. Here you have stem cells that are proliferating, and so we did, okay, let's try to kill the, st the stem cells. Let's try to prevent them from proliferating. And this is pretty easy because we have neighbors that are working on cancer, they have a bunch of drugs and technology to kill proliferating cells. So we use uh, antimitotic drugs, we use also laser therapy to kill selectively the stem cells within the olfactory system here, and also colleagues did the same, and we eventually observed different behavioral outputs. So nobody managed to replicate that much the result of each other which was uh, probably due to the fact that we were using different behavioral uh, strategy and also because the brain is able to compensate, to cope with the loss of neurons. So another strategy would be, rather than deleting uh, the neurons, let's try to stimulate them. The problem in the brain is that when you want to stimulate a neuron, if you want to stimulate this guy, usually you use a, an, an electric uh, stimulation, and when you stick an electrode in the brain, the electrode do, 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 do not know exactly which neuron to stimulate. So how can we stimulate just this neuron and not his neighbor that is next to, it, to him? 
One way is a new technology that have been uh, developed uh, almost well, 10 years ago, which is called optogenetic. Optogenetic is based on a simple um, uh, protein, which is a photosensitive protein, which is when you stimulate with blue light, this protein called channel rhodopsin. I will use this word several times during the talk, so please remember channel rhodopsin. When you stimulate channel rhodopsin with blue light, this protein is a canal, it can open and let ions enter into the, the cell. And basically, if you put this protein into a neuron and you flash some light, you can activate the neuron. Just like with a remote, you can t activate or in inhibit the neuron. And what the beauty of this is that it's a genetic tool, so you can target this protein whenever you want in the brain using all the genetic knowledge that we have. We use light, and to bring new light in the brain, we use uh, optic fibers. These tools are, are really uh, uh, mature now because they are pretty rapid. They can be cell selective due to genetic, and they can activate or inhibit the, the, the neurons. And on the top of that, we can now activate some neurons within the mouse and see what happens when you stimulate one neuron to the behavior of this mouse. This is a classical experiment. People in this uh, experiment, they did, they infect some neurons in the, in the striatum. The striatum is the, is, the, is the part of the brain that de degenerates uh, in Parkinson's disease, and that is important for motor coordination. And in this experiment, they put chenarobsin in the left striatum. And they stick an optic, an optic fiber into the brain of this animal, and when they start to flash the light, hear what they can see. You can see that the animal is turning in one side because you stimulate the side that is controlling the movement of the animal. And when the light is off, off, the animal comes back. So this technology is, is rather impressive because if you do that with an electrical uh, stimulation in the striatum, you don't see that at all. So we said, okay, let's use this technology to stimulate only the green cell, the adult brain neurons, without activating the, the red cells, the pre-existing cells. So that's what we did. We bring uh, channel in the neurons with uh, lentiviral vectors. And because the bulb is at the surface of the brain, we could, rather than using optic fibers, we could directly bring some light uh, at the surface of the bulb, and we used miniature LEDs that are able to, to, sh to shine uh, some light on the surface. And then we asked the mouse uh, uh, some uh, olfactory processes, because we are in the olfactory system. We asked the mouse, okay, can you discriminate between two doors? To ask a question to a mouse, it's kind of difficult. They do not speak that much. French or Brazilian or English. So the trick we use is that we ask the mouse to associate one odor, S plus, with a reward, and a second odor without reward. So the animal, when the animal has learned correctly the task, it will systematically uh, go for a reward that is presented on the left here when you have a, uh, an odor S plus, and the S, S minus is not rewarded. So the animal can discriminate between odors, and the animal can also learn between the, those, uh, those, uh, those odors. So if you perform randomly in this task, if you don't pay attention to the reward, you have a percentage of, of, of correct response, which is 50%. But as soon as you start to learn, you can reach 100%. And this is the case of these mice. These mice, uh, these mice had to discriminate between two different orders, banana versus orange. And as you can see, we here I compare control and animals with channel scene in the newborn neurons that are stimulated with light. And you see no effect at all in the learning curve, in the number of trials for the animal to reach uh, a good mark. It's only when we start to, to challenge the animal with a difficult task. It's not banana orange, now it's orange versus tangerine. So really similar orders. We started to see that newborn neurons, when they are stimulated, they improve the speed of learning in these animals. And, and to make a long story short, we, we did a, a lot of control to show that it's really specific to neurons. Is it specific to, uh, to the cell we stimulate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Another story, you see, learning seems to be improved by the stimulation of adult, no, adult born neurons. What happens if we do the opposite? What are the newborn neurons sensitive to learning? So the, what, we, what we know from the, the literature is that uh, when the neurons arrive in the structure, they rapidly, so if you pulse, if you mark the neurons, and measure the arrival of the neurons in the olfactory bulb, you see that they rapidly arrive, and a few days after they arrive, they start to decrease here. It, and this is because, as in development, you have a strong process of apoptosis and cell selection. 
So neurons that are badly connected in the network, they automatically enter into cell deaths through apoptosis. So we, we said, okay, what happens if we uh, put some learning during this phase of cell selection? And what we observe is that when your animal is trained to associate an odor with a reward, we can boost the, the cell survival in these neurons only during a small critical period. You see that the effect of learning is really affecting the cell density only in a specific critical period. Okay, so the, the next step was to understand where and what these, these neurons, when they get connected to the network, what are the partners? These cells have two types of partners. They have locally local partners, which are matrix cells that are driving sensory inputs. But they have also cortical partners that are inputs coming from a distant region that are bringing some memory-associated uh, information. And to our surprise, these two inputs are completely segregated on the more on the surface of these cells. Uh, adult bar neurons receive local input on the apical part, and on the basal and proximal part, they receive cortical memory inputs. And so then we ask, what, if we now train the animals again in this olfactory memory task and see the plasticity of these uh, inputs, what we observe is that, uh, so to do that, we, we label the spines with some genetic trick to label uh, only glutamatergic spines, and we could observe that during uh, olfactory learning and not during control group when you have just odor exposure or just air, you have an increase in cortical inputs onto these adult bone neurons, not local sensory inputs. And uh, work from my colleague, he tried also to see if these inputs are more functional and he could observe that these inputs coming from the cortex, we could put channel opsin again in, this, in, this, in these inputs, stimulate selectively those inputs with light, and we could observe that these synapse not only they are more numerous, but they are stronger. So learning improved the connectivity from the olfactory bulb to the cortex and improved the, the memory uh, uh, network into the system. And last, uh, really rapidly, I will show uh, how we're now trying to uh, image those neurons, try to understand what are the messages they carry. And to do that, we use two-photon imaging uh, in mice. Mice are infected with two viruses to express two proteins, uh, TD tomato, it is a red protein that allows us to see the cell and the morphology of the cell. And also GCAM6, this is a genetically encoded calcium indicator that is uh, important to measure cell activity. We could, we could observe during two photon imaging the morphology, not only also the morphology but the spine dynamic, and also the cell response. And this within a living animal that is performing the task. So we can really monitor the activity of the brain while the animal is doing something. So take a message, added knowledge, knowledge is improve olfactory learning, promote synaptic plasticity, and as a reciprocal, olfactory learning enhance added bound survival, promote synaptic plasticity, and shape sensory coordinates. So this is a general uh, overview of what we do on the, on the topic of learning and memory, but we, we come out come upon different aspects also that are regulating adult neurogenesis, which is also sleep. In fact, sleep is really important for shaping uh, the cell survival within, in the system. And in fact, adult neurogenesis is really sensitive to other aspects, which are mood disorders, neuroinflammation, genetic mutation, and the last but not least, also microbiota. We are starting now a new uh, kind of collaboration with people in Pasteur to, so, to see how the brain is sensing the influence of the microbiota within our gut. And this is the purpose of this big symposium that have been highlighted by uh, Christian Brechot yesterday, which is trying to understand how the brain and the microbes interact. Not only the microbes that we've been uh, discussing about infectious disease, how infectious disease affect neurolog neurological disorders uh, in different diseases. This is one aspect, but also in normal animal, normal brain, how the microbiota and the brain discuss with each other. And so I will invite you to come on July to this first symposium on microbes and brain, which is a grand program the character of Pasteur. And I hope that it will also bring some new uh, added value from, uh, from Brazil and from Focus and from uh, University of Sao Paulo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization of this meeting, especially Chiu Savino, to give us the opportunity to show a little bit about our work in Fiocruz. To be fair, I came to Fear Cruise has past two years and a half. Yeah. 
And so uh, since I uh, have to change a little bit my science field, where before I was studying mostly uh, about uh, depression disorder, generally to depressive disorders, and also anxiety. And coming to Fiocruz, I changed for a little bit more infections and neuro and immunology. And for me, especially it was very nice, came to Savino groups because I'm learning a lot about immunology and adding this immunology field in neuroscience. So I will just present uh, some results we, we produce here about this project, the effect of resveratrol on schizophrenic-like behavior uh, induced by immunogenic challenger or immunogenic stimuli by poly C during pregnancy. It's a, a part of a biggest project where we are studying the genetic, environmental, and neuroimmunological factors associated to psychiatric disorders. Much more ambitious project, but we're going to have, have a little view about this one. So first, uh, I will try to just convince you that uh, the, this kind of disease is really interesting and also at the same time very uh, challenging to study. Uh, about this schizophrenia, is a very complex uh, disease in terms of uh, uh, clinical manifestation where patients have, may have positive, negative, and cognitive uh, symptoms. I just highlight these symptoms because it's sometimes when you're doing uh, modeling, uh, animal modeling, we just try to pick some of these uh, phenomena where patients may, can show hallucination or uh, negative, uh, negative symptoms like uh, social withdrawal or leg em emotion, and also cognitive symptoms from working memory deficits. But in my opinion, these this pictures are from Salvador Dali is like a visual uh, description about the schizophrenia, because when you talk uh, with patients with schizophrenia, it's something like they, it's not he disconnected to reality, but to me, at least for me, it looks like some he building his, his own reality. So it's really the disability disease and very complex one too. So in terms of genetic background, is, there is more than 20 years of evidence that about the genetic background. As we can see, the exponential growth of uh, susceptibility to schizophrenia in between uh, between the general population, where we, we find around 1% of uh, susceptibility, compared to twins, where we can reach about 15, 48% of susceptibility. So there's another very interesting uh, data about the environment, where we can compare a urban area, very high uh, in urbanicity, compared to very low urbanicity, uh, where this area is possible to have al almost three times higher frequency of schizophrenia compared to the other ones. So it's made interesting everyone's here because we are on, ex ex I, I hope so, almost of us is on very dangerous areas because this, we are in capital or, or very urbanized area. Also, another very interesting uh, evidence about their environment is when we compare the season of years about schizophrenia, where we ha you, you can have almost three, uh, two and a half times more schizophrenia or 15% high frequency of schizophrenia during the January or winter compared to the rest of the year. is is special evidence for schizophrenia, but not for depression or other psychiatric disorders. So, and another very interesting evidence about the immunology associated to schizophrenia is when you compare patients where has a history or at least immunology evidence of uh, contact with some of these infection uh, virus, where these patients usually show higher uh, impairments of cognitive tasks. This cognitive task is very simple one, as I can show here where you ask the patient to link points in order in number orders and the second staff you can also ask him to link the same dots but uh, shifting to number to letters and when this one is, is higher cognitive staff and they really show higher depth when the patient has immunological evidence 
into contact with some of these HSV virus or CMV virus. So taking all this together, there is a strong effort to try to identify which kind of uh, mechanisms is evolved to, to improve in susceptibility to schizophrenia. And there is a uh, group trying to find uh, this evidence because there is very interesting result here where they show the uh, uh, patient which receive uh, stem cells from uh, another, uh, another, another patient, another individual who has his brothers with his schizophrenia, this patient becomes to psychiatric disorders. So he gained this, this, this disease from, an, from a cell, from a patient related to a schizophrenia patient. So there is a great effort to understand how this mechanism can, can in, uh, how could I say, can uh, transmit this disease to another one. So just summar summarizing, there is a huge uh, effect that can produce schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenia disease, but the point I'd like to highlight here is looking at this, this scenario, sometimes it makes me to think that this schizophrenia or this kind of disease it's something like a cast, a cast of cards. Because there is, when you compare to depressive disorders, uh, of course there is also a genetic background evidence for depressive disorders, but per, perhaps uh, for depression, dif different from schizophrenia, most of the time, stress is the center point or most of the key point to produce depressive disorder. But schizophrenia, there is not like this. It's not like this. There is a many different factors can drive the, the depressive state or schizophrenia state, or some, somehow they are really tiny connected. And if you change one of these, can per precipitate in schizophrenia. So just to highlight why we did ch choose to work with this project at this time, uh, I take again a meta-analysis uh, data where we can see hymenology or hymenology signaling is really related to precipitated to schizophrenia disorders and especially interferon gamma. I took this one because another previous evidence showing that uh, cells of patients treated with different antidepressive uh, anti-schizophrenic drugs Haloperidol, clozapina, or ketchupina, hisperidona, pro, uh, reduce the expression of interferon gamma. Uh, but this effect is, it doesn't happen with other high monocytokines. So it uh, shows us that maybe uh, interferon gamma may be a key point, key point to antipsychotic anti drugs. And now again, Resveratrol, that's a drug with a fate of like uh, 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 anti-inflammatory and, and also antioxidant anti drugs, also reduce expression of interferon gamma. And this effect we cannot be seen for other high monocytokines too. And based with this evidence and also together with Huji Marfrosa, is, I think he's in this uh, auditorium, have shown that treatment with resveratrol can produce uh, anti-protective, neuronal protective effect, effect. So based on this evidence, we decided to, to propose these two objectives on this project. First one is to investigate whether uh, a treatment with resveratrol would have a protective effect to high stimuli, stimuli with a potential risk for schizophrenia-like phenotype induced by immune stimulation during pregnancy. Uh, at the same time, we're going to see the potential role of interferon gamma. And the second one is investigate whether there is interaction between per uh, parental and offspring hymen competitors related to interferon gamma genotype on potential risk for schizophrenia phenotype induced by hymen uh, stimulated during pregnancy, a potential effect of resveratrol. I, I will try to explain this two objective uh, using this, this table. 
where the first one we, we're gonna see just the, the difference of interferon genotype uh, when the mothers of the are submitted to a treatment with pol IC or stimuli, high stimuli with pol IC, and you compare this, these two genotypes. And the second one, we're gonna play a little bit more, where we're gonna change the genotype of the embryon using, uh, by this, this different kind of uh, breeding. First, we have a male, hydrozygote, hydrozygote to interferogram or hymozygote to uh, interferogram, and in the mother, they are uh, hormone deficient in terms of interferogram or hormone competent to interferogram. And we're going to have the pubs. Part of them will be hormone deficient to interferogram. A part of them will be hormone competent to interferogram. And we're going to see how the poly I see stimuli during the pregnancy can modulate this effect in terms of development of brain and to precipitate into schizophrenic-like behavior. So by this inbreeding, we're going to see how the interaction, or we're going to make some questions about how the interaction of the embryon and mother hormone system can modulate the brain development uh, and baby-related schizophrenic-like behavior. So as the, our first results, we did a, a social interaction test where we have animal in two different compartments, and here there is a uh, test animal where we let him, let it to explore this, this two compartment where we have here uh, toy mice and uh, in here uh, real mice. And uh, the, first time, uh, the first task, we, we count the number, number of interactions and the time of interaction in between the toy mice and the real mice. And here we can see that the, these animals have preference to explore the, the real mice. And uh, when we compare the wild type, interferon gamma knockout mice. That was nice for us because, okay. because we just showing that the experiment is working. And the second task, we change this toy mice for another mice and we count the time of interaction in between these two types and we can see that interferon gamma knockout mice have preference to a new one mice compared to the other mice. So he also have the preference to interaction with another mice, but with a new one. Uh, and the other uh, test is, was uh, object recognition, where we put the animal to explore uh, apparatus with two identical object and the second and then we can see they have no preference for anyone but the second time we just do uh, substitute this one for a new object and again we can see that interferogram knockout mice have preference to explore a new object this is kind of nice nice also because we can see that for somehow these animals have greater cognitive performance compared to wild type animal so that first two experiment was just to confirm that our test was working, and here we have now our first results, our entire protocol, where we took the, the, the pregnant mice and treated them with six days with resveratrol, and the embryo day nine, we challenged it with poly C and followed these animals to the postnatal. 62 when we perform the behavior test. And then we can see here that uh, poly, uh, those, again, these animals have greater preference to explore the, the new object while the, the task is working. But unfortunately, even resveratrol or policy have no effect on this, on this experiment. So, it is it's, uh, here again. We use uh, the uh, social interaction and use the same experiment. And once again, all groups have preference to explore the new one to, to the, the animals compared to the object, the toy mice. And here also, the mice has preference to the new animal compared to the animal they know before. 
But again, Hesperus Raw or policy have no effect on this, on this task. So we start to ask what, can, what could happen with these experiments because we are expecting. We just treat the animals with the policy. You see that the sick behavior by force and sim test is what's like a, 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 a expected result for this kind of experiment. And we, we didn't see any effect by the elevated blues maze. So this, I just like to, to thank so for the, my, this group, especially to Dr. Savino because uh, he's opened your doors for, at the laboratory of Timo to, to uh, permit us to work on this. And also Hudmar Froze, and also Silvia Guiter, Adriana Polman to, pro, to uh, help us with the resveratrol, and also Tatiana, Vicente, Natalia. They are our uh, students working with us, and also Marino Trajano, Vlamir for technical support, and Elena, and Elaine for the uh, off sheet that makes this work possible. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next speaker comes from Montevideo from the Pastoral Institutes, and it's uh, Luis Barbeto, who's going to tell us about targeting neuroinflammation in neurodegenerative disease. So, Luis, it's yours. Good morning. I want to thank the organizers for this kind invitation, and I am I'm very happy of this signature of the agreement between USP Fio Cruz Pasteur Institute, and we are uh, ready to join this effort from Montevideo. Our institute is is quite new, about nine years old, and we have about 20, 100 people. 200 people work, working in the institute. So today I will work, I will talk about neuroscience in the institute, which only has three works working on, on this field. And I'll say that we already have a number of collaborations uh, with other institutes there, with other countries within Latin America, and we have a, a current projects with Fio Cruz and our institute and the Institute Max Planck from Argentina and Paraguay working uh, funded by FOSEM, Mercosur funding. So we are ready to work on this network and we are very happy with it. And then let me introduce you the, the three groups working in neuroscience in our, in our institute. Uh, our, my group is on neurodegeneration then Hugo Pelufo leads an, another group in, in neuroinflammation and shunt therapy. And there is a, say, a third work, a third group led by Flavio working in, in development. So today I will offer uh, our experience uh, during almost 20 years on neurodegenerative diseases. And we will be proud to collaborate with you in, in this field. Of course, this is, you all know, this is a, a very challenging uh, subject be, because the prevalence of neurodegeneration is increasing because the population is getting older. It costs a lot of money to sustain all these people. Uh, there are no effective treatment or prevention therapies. We can do a, a genetic test that is predicted, but we have not the good treatment to do. So. Ethically, we cannot do that. And, and then there is one aspect of this disease, in the pathogeny of this disease, that is the fact that this disease, all of them, uh, develops with neuroinflammation. And so our hypothesis has been that perhaps by stopping the neuroinflammatory component, we could stop or delay the progression of the disease. And this was our approach during the last 20 years was not a neuron centralist approach, but rather a glial cell approach, because glial cells are the ones that mainly drive the inflammation. So let me put this example of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is starting the temporal lobe very deeply, campus, uh, uh, and then spread with the time to all over the cortical tissue and subcortical nuclei. So at this stage, the patients are completely demented. 
And so this is the progression of the disease that we want to stop. We want to stop the disease at certain level just to delay the symptomatology. And, and so we focus on, on astrocyte and microglia cell. This is a cacali stain in showing how astrocyte contacts and are really in, 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 in close approach with neurons huh? and provide the metabolic support, uh, synaptic support, uh, structural support, trophic support, and, and, and many other things, including the regenerative condition of the brain that is not really, with the exception of the, of the neurogenetic areas, is mainly the regeneration of the brain, is mainly due to glial cells. So we have been working in different models. The main one is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which I will present a, a, a summary of what we have done. But we also have found evidence that glial cells also modulate the, the, the regeneration of neurons in Alzheimer's disease models and also in neurometamodic model. Uh, of degeneration. So in ALS, uh, you all know perhaps that this is a, a, a disease that upper motor neuron degenerate and also the lower motor neuron that innervate the skeletal muscle degenerates and so leading to paralysis, fasciculations, and, and death of most of the patients within the four to five years. Uh, we have two models of the disease that contains one gene related to the familiar case of ALS in, in mice and rats. So we have used these models to do the cell culture and, and also preclinical trials. And during the years, we have found that, that uh, astrocyte uh, expressing this mutation that caused ALS in vivo are completely altered and they express a number of increased pro-inflammatory conditions and also uh, oxidative stress and, meta and mitochondrial defect that finally will uh, exert apoptosis stimuli to motor neurons that will degenerate by complex mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a classical approach. But then a few years ago, we found that in addition to, to the classical or pro-inflammatory astrocyte in the brain, there was another population, another population of astrocytes or glial cells that were, were there and, and had the capacity to proliferate and migrate to, to other axes of the brain, so providing toxicity and, and progression of the disease. And so we, we kept many years to isolate this, this new neuronal uh, glial cell types. And finally, we could isolate that in, in culture and, and also found micro markers for these neurons. And we call these, these cells ABA cells because aberrant astrocytes. And, and so we can find here a, a motor neuron surrounded by, by three ABA cells that are labeled with chi, chi A67, which is a proliferating marker. These cells rapidly proliferate in the spinal cord of the generating spinal cord. And, and, and so they have the active proliferation. They do not have replicative senescence. They express a typical markers. And in vivo, they, they are, comp they, and in vitro, they, they are uh, extremely toxic for motor neurons in co-culture system. So this is the way we've, we isolated the cells, just culturing the spinal cord of symptomatic rats at the end stage of the disease. So you see how the cells uh, completely rapidly uh, produce a monolayer cells compared with almost non-cell culturing in, 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 in healthy animals. They express a number of, of, uh, of markers, including connexin 40, 40, 43 and no glutamate, transport, glutamate transporter. And of course, they are completely toxic for motor neurons in co-cultures. You see that, that there is non-motor neuron surviving of the top of the ABA cells, and also the, the, the conditioned media are, is toxic. So we can say that the, the ABA cells uh, are, are toxic for motor neurons, including to dilution to 1 to 1,000, which is extremely high.
this, this toxicity. We then learned that, that these cells that are completely aberrant are originated in, in, in microglia cells. Microglia is do a, a, a phenotypic transition from the classical microglia to a more uh, astrocyte-like cells and the senchymal-like cells that uh, proliferate surrounding the motor neurons. And here you have the typical marker of these cells uh, doing the transition around the motor neurons that are here. We also had the possibility to found the cells in, in human beings. So we, in, in, in collaboration with Pamela Shaw in, in Sheffield University, we found the cells located in, in the spinal cord. And, and you see here the classical motor neuron cell body surrounded by one, two, three, four, five other cells labeled here with connectin 43 staining. We also can culture the cells that can be maintained as a, as a cell line because they do not have replicative senescence. And, and so we can produce these cells and transplant these cells into the spinal cord. And, and so we see that these cells rapidly expand. This is an emi spinal cord, rapidly expand in the emi section of the spinal cord. Uh, do not go to the white matter, but destroyed all the motor neurons in the way. Mm -hmm. And they produce a huge microgliosis all around the spinal cord up to the cervical cord. But the most important thing that this cell type gave us the possibility to uh, start a drug development targeting the cells that for us, they are the responsible to spread the disease along the neural axis. So we, we tried many things, but I will show you the best drug that really stop the proliferation of these cells and, and also have a beneficial effect, at least in the animal model of ALS. So, so with this, we created during years this, uh, the neurodegenerative niche which contains, as well as in cancer, there is a niche for cancer development. In neurodegeneration, we have a, a niche with different cell types, including blood cells and also astrocyte, oligodendrocyte, and, and microglia cells, and pericytes that are all helping to neurodegeneration to progress. And, and so we, we well, we, we found that these cells contain many markers of, of SASP. This is senescence associated secretory phenotype. And these cells are re really producing uh, uh, pro-inflammatory products that are, are really uh, producing uh, metaplasia of lyl cells. And then, okay, where I just very close. And then we found a, a drug called macitinib, which is a tyrosine inhibitor used in cancer uh, therapy. And, and this macitinib, uh, we found that it blocks the proliferation of other cells and also the migration of other cells. And when delivered to, to the uh, ALS rats, it really prolongs almost double the disease, sur the, this, the, the survival time of these rats after it is delivered, uh, after symptomatic. So there is a, a company, a French company called Abessiance, uh, that has put this drug on, on a phase two, three trial, and now more than 200 patients are being treated with this in double blind, so we, we don't know whether this, this drug will, will benefit. This work has been done with Olivier Ermin in, in Necker uh, Hospital. And, and so here are the, 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 the impressive results of macitinib. You see that it completely blocks the appearance of other cells. It completely or, or significantly broke the, the number of proliferating cells. It also inhibits the macrogliosis and also 
and prevents the degeneration of motor neurons in the spinal cord with only 20 days of treatment, which is, is all, uh, for our view, is the most potent drug uh, ever described in the preclinical model of ALS. Okay, so the end. Uh, we think that by doing our approach, this is a neuron surrounded by glial cells. When you have a stress damage, the, these glial cells will respond rapidly to adapt and compensate the defect and the injury. And most of the time, this is, is sufficient to, to, to maintain the healthy situation. But sometimes, this response is completely abnormal, and you have an excessive response with the appearance of new cell type, this, which is a, a kind of dysplasia or metaplasia of glial cells that will produce a, a really active disease that will provide neurodegeneration. And so we can block at this stage, we can block this, this transition by using uh, the tyrosine inhibitors, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Okay, I want to thank my collaborators and thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luis. So the last presentation uh, will be done by Siddhartha Hiberu, coming from the uh, Federal University of Huguenot in the North. And uh, he's going to speak about mechanisms of learning and forget, forgetting over sleep. So that afterwards we can dream of collaborations. Well, thank you very much, uh, Savino, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. This is a very important moment, uh, this, this uh, agreement between the Fiocruz and Pasteur and USP, and I'm, I'm glad to be uh, part of the, the group that can witness it and meet uh, uh, friends from, from long time ago, like Cecilia, and also meet uh, uh, new, new researchers, uh, some of whom I had heard before, like Luis Barbeto, and some others whom I have all, had only read papers. Uh, so it's, it's really a pleasure. Uh, we have one problem here? Okay, good. Um, I know it's a little late and I don't want you to sleep through my talk, so let me go really quick through the introduction. I'm not going to go into the details, but in the past 40 years it became very clear that sleep deprivation can impair learning. And both sleep phases, the main sleep phases, the so-called slow-wave sleep, the non-dreaming phase of sleep, as well as the REM sleep or paradoxical sleep, like the French like to say, uh, which is uh, con concomitant with the dreaming, they both have an influence on learning. So typically, for example, if you impair an animal from sleep after training in a, in a, in a water maze, some, some uh, deprived groups will show uh, an impairment on the next day. And you can do it in humans, and you can actually decouple it from the stress effects by depriving the person on the first night and testing after two normal ni nights, so on the third day, and you see that the performance of the deprived subjects is much lower than the performance of uh, subjects that uh, were not deprived. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. I just want to stress that both sleep phases contribute to learning, and it's a, it's a current um, debate on whether they play separate roles or what exactly each phase is doing. I'm going to go into detail on this. I just want to mention that this has some practical applicability. Uh, for example, can you, can you use naps in the school setting to enhance learning? Uh, we've been pursuing this, this, this direction for, for many years. This is the first paper that we got out of this. Uh, it was a, a, a master's uh, of Natalia Lemos and a colleague Janaina helped with this. Uh, basically, we took uh, 11 to 12-year-old students and offered them a, an experimental lecture on, on topics that they were not supposed to know at this age like uh, uh, you know, the visual system and how the nervous system is structured. And then we randomized them in two groups. The one group stayed in class and the other group went to another room to have access to a nap over a mat and a mask, with a, a night mask. So basically uh, we tried to provide everything we could to make the nap possible in the school setting, but also nothing that you would not be able to provide in a regular Latin American school. So, you know, cheap approach. Basically, what we found is that if you go back and test them, do a surprise test, one, two, or five days later, you find that there is about 10% of learning 
compared to the pretest in both groups, the nap and the waking, on the first day. So 24 hours later, they learn the same, so sleep is not helping them learn more. However, if you test them two days or five days later, you see that the, the waking group, the group that went to another class, does not retain that information. So it seems like sleep is enhancing the duration of the learned content, which is what you want from education, right? That people learn and retain that information for a while. We repeated this, well, we replicated this experiment in a different way using a small sub, uh, group of subjects over and over again every week, shuffling them through the groups, and we found about the same results we are submitting this paper soon. So, I mean, this is sort of a sidetrack on my work. My work is mostly about mechanisms. What are the mechanisms that are triggered during sleep that can allow memories to be consolidated, for, forgotten, or transformed? Those are three aspects. Strengthening, forgetting, and, and, and change of memories that all occur during sleep. Uh, one way to think about this, and I think it's very useful, is, it was put forth by Donald Hebb in this fantastic book, The Organization of Behavior in 49. What he said is, for a memory encoding event to generate a long-lasting memory, two things need to happen in a sequence. The first thing is what he termed neuronal reverberation. He said, the brain needs to deal with new information more or less as it is. With the, he didn't use those words, but basically with, bio, with the biochemical uh, apparatus that it has. You know, it doesn't have time after two milliseconds to do, you know, new protein synthesis or anything. It needs to get this information and reverberate it. But, and, and, and this is something you should find in the, in the in changes in firing rates or in the synchronization of neurons. But you cannot rely on this kind of mechanism for a long-lasting memory, right? You cannot, if, you, if I ask you now to think of the name of your first friend in school when you were, I don't know, five years old, please do this. So you just did it. You were not thinking about this name a minute ago, but it's there. You just activate the network and you can retrieve it very quickly. How is that done? Then Heb said, well, that's done by structural change. So you change the way the neurons talk to each other, so it's a morphological change, and the memory trace that was an active memory trace becomes a latent memory trace. So in current words, we would call this synaptic plasticity or, or neuronal plasticity. Okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about each part. Uh, for neuronal reverberation, how do you go about studying it? Well, you can image the neurons uh, as, they, as they fire, or you can try to record their electrical activity with, with electrodes. One way to do this is to implant extracellular recording electrodes in many parts of the brain. The animals recover pretty fine after five, six days. You can start recording them. When you open the, 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 the program that can allow you to record them, in this particular case, you can see every little rectangle here corresponds to one of those wires. If you click here, you can see the, in more detail what the potentials are, and then using a variety of techniques like principal components analysis, you're going to say, well, the green one seems like one neuron, the yellow one seems like another neuron, it's a putative neuron because you're not really recording from within the neuron, but it's good enough. And you can record from many, many wires uh, the action potentials, and from the same wires record the local few potentials, which are lower frequency signals that will allow you to say whether the animal is in waking or slow of sleep or paradoxical sleep. And here it's just to show that you can re remove those electrodes from the brain of the animals after weeks of recording and the brains are still okay, you know, if the surgery was good, that you don't destroy the, new, the tissue. And this is recorded in somatosensory cortex in the barrel field, in the visual cortex as a negative control. The experiments were done in the dark, so this was supposed to be a negative control. In this, uh, in, the, in the hippocampus, in the CA1 field, and other regions. Uh, one experiment that we've been doing over and over again is a, a, a novel object uh, exposure paradigm. Basically, we record the animals as they cycle spontaneously from wake, slow wave, and REM for hours. Then we expose them to novel objects for a few minutes. This is done in the dark, as I mentioned before, using infrared uh, illumination. And then we record them in the post-exposure phase for hours again. Uh, and some people that are not familiar with the, with the paradigm may say, well, how do you know they learn anything? Because you don't control, the animals are doing what they, whatever they please. So one way that you can show that they learn, and we, we saw this before in Frederico's talk, is that you can expose them to some of the same objects and some new objects. They prefer the new objects, so they, they certainly know the difference. Uh, one way to go about this, how, how do you look for, for memory patterns? If, when I started my postdoc, I was looking for, for a way to, to capture the persistence or the, or the reverberation of a certain pattern. And one way to do this is to use this algorithm developed by Matt Wilson at MIT 
uh, and published uh, in, in about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, which he called the neuronal ensemble correlation method. This is actually the same thing as a, as a Pearson correlation of, between pairs of neurons, but now instead of getting two, all the neurons two by two, you get all the neurons at once as a matrix of neurons, and you say, okay, so during those 10 seconds here, when I have you know, 100 neurons in the cortex, thalamus, hippocampus, and putamen, I take those 10 seconds of activity of the life of the animal, and I use, I use this as a template, and I calculate this Pearson correlation throughout the, the data set as a moving window, and I generate a series of correlations. Of course, when I go through the same moment, I get a one, that's a sanity check, right? So what do we, we learn from this sort of technique? Uh, I'm gonna show you two animal, uh, data from, from two animals. In red, the post-exposure correlation, so basically templates taken during the exposure, and then calculated over the next 48 hours nonstop. So how does this pattern reverberate in the next 48 hours? And in the other case, for control, we got templates of activity when the animals were alert during theta rhythm. For those that know the hippocampus, theta rhythm is when the animal is awake, is a signal of alertness. And then we, we used moments in which the animals were exploring the environments, but 48 hours before the novel objects. So they were exploring a familiar environment, and you're going to see the black correlations for the next 48 hours. When we did that, we found that for every rat that we looked into, the red correlations, the post-exposure correlations are much larger than the pre-exposure correlations, and this persists over time. There's a decay here. Uh, both of them decay, but then you see that the red ones are always above the black ones. Notice that the correlations are small. So when people talk about replay during sleep, this is a little bit misleading, because replay means play again. It's like a repetition. And you don't see this repetition in mammals. You can see it in particular nuclei in songbirds because these are nuclei that only code for one object, that song. But in mammals, in the hippocampus, the neurons are multiplexing information, so you don't see high correlations, okay? It's something between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, a low fidelity replay, if you want. Um, we also said, well, this should be very specific of the hippocampus, or maybe the hippocampus in the cortex. It shouldn't be in the thalamus. No, wrong, it was in the thalamus, it was in the putamen, it was everywhere we looked. Uh, we, we actually sent this paper first to science and they said, oh, this is like Lashley, who was this scientist in the 30s and 40s that said that the, the code was distributed, that you could not localize function, right? We know he was not right, but in terms of reverberation, I think this is not a property of any system, it's a property of the telencephalic and diencephalic cells, maybe even below that. Um, and then the third thing, so it, uh, it does occur in multiple brain areas. And the other thing that we, we found that was very interesting is the, the state dependent dynamics of these relations. So here you have 44 hours of recording, and every time you have a trough, every time the correlations decrease, you are in blue, you are in waking. Every time the correlations increase, you are in red or green, which is slow wave and REM sleep. You can look into more detail, you know, from early moments or in the middle of the end of the recording, you always have this dynamic, you know, waking low and then increase during sleep and then come down during wake, increase during sleep, come down during wake, and so on and so forth. Okay? Notice that there's much more slow sleep than REM sleep. Okay? You spend most of your time, and the rats also most of the time of sleep in slow sleep. So if neuronal reverberation is doing anything to memory consolidation, it is doing it mostly during slow sleep. Okay? Uh, also notice that this rise in the correlations is not instantaneous. It's not enough for the animal to shut down the perceptual uh, 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 apparatus and go to sleep. It, something needs to be build up, and that's probably involving uh, you know, biochemical cascades, phosphorylation of kinases, and so on. Uh, if you just look at the raw data firing rates normalized by the maximum, you see that for hippocampus low, uh, primary somatosensory cortex and primary visual cortex, there's very little change in rates before and after the experience for hippocampus and V1. V1 because, again, the experiment was done in the dark. But for S1, there's a long-lasting change in the fine rates, and I'm showing here only the slow sleep episodes. They are concatenated, and you can see the boundaries here in the bottom. So this means that when the animal goes through a tactile exploration of novel objects, for the next three hours at least, the rates, not just correlations, but the rates will be increased you know, uh, substantially in the cortex, but not in the hippocampus. This evokes this famous case of patient HM, a famous patient in neurology that had both hippocampus removed due to epilepsy. That was in the 50s. 
that cured the epilepsy, but that caused the embarrassment of never again having episodic memories. This, this patient could never again learn the name of, of, a, of a doctor that was interviewing him. Okay? This is a famous case that opened our eyes to the function of the hippocampus in the acquisition of episodic memories. This patient also developed retrograde amnesia, not just anterograde amnesia for the future, but retrograde amnesia for the recent events leading to the surgery, but not for the childhood stuff. So this patient illuminated this concept that memories that are hippocampus dependent for the acquisition are corticalized over time. But nobody knows how. And the results that we got in the rats suggest that maybe sleep is playing a role in this because the reverberation persists in the cortex and not in the hippocampus. I know Savino will give me three more minutes, right? Vincent, yes? Merci beaucoup. Uh, because we need to talk about the second part of the, of the, of the story, which is the part of the, the synaptic plasticity, or what I have called the morphological changes that can transform an active memory trace into a latent memory trace. Uh, of course, this machinery here was unknown to have, and now it's in every textbook. And basically, it's showing us how you know, the, the release of glutamate in the synaptic cleft can eventually lead to the entry of calcium, phosphorylation of a bunch of kinases, and the activation of gene expression by, in this case, the phosphorylation of CREP1, uh, and then you know, different sorts of genes being transcribed in response to this dendritic event here. Uh, I, I selected ARC as an example of an effector gene, so that the, the RNA is transported to the, to the uh, uh, postsynaptic terminal, translated there, and does you know, a lot in terms of uh, phosphorylating amper receptors, bringing uh, the cytoskeleton together with the enzymes, like CAMP kinase 2, together. If you, if you uh, block ARC with antisense, the animals become amnesic. They learn on day one, they don't, forget, they don't remember on day two. And then an example of a regulated gene, zif 68 it encodes for a transcription factor, so the protein goes back in the nucleus, and the genes, in particular synapsins 1 and 2, which are the most abundant proteins of synapses. So if, you, if the neuron is making new synapses, it will need ZIF-268, and indeed, if you knock out ZIF-268 in a mouse, it will learn on day one, it can induce long-term potentiation on day one, it doesn't remember on day two. So, uh, early on I started studying uh, ZIF-268, and my question was, can I, can I uh, look for gene expression that is specific or, or related to the different wake slow waves uh, in REM states, right? So let the animal go into the state of choice, and then you wake the animal up for 30 minutes, you keep them all awake so the, the experience is the same for all the groups, and then you kill the animal at the peak of the RNA of, of interest, in this case, ZIF-268. Uh, and we compare two groups of animals, animals that had nothing to process, nothing new, animals that never learned their home cages, and animals that were exposed to a rat's Disney lands made of cardboard boxes and PVC tubes. What we found is that these are in situ hybridization autoradiograms uh, for ZIF-268. In the boring situation, the expression of the gene is very high in the cortex in the hippocampus during wake, and it decreases during sleep. In the novel situation, a few hours after the novel situation, the experience is high in waking, low during slow sleep, and increases again during REM sleep. Um, some people uh, argued since then that maybe this is, we took this as a sign of, say, LTP-like mechanisms during REM sleep after novel experience. Some people think it's more complicated, that ZIF has a, plays a more complicated role. So we said, let's look for something that, is in, that nobody would argue is, is, is certainly related to LTP, and that would be the first relation of chem kinase 2, uh, just showing a different bunch of functions that it may have. Let me skip this because it, we have little time. We repeated the same experiments, but now instead of waiting half an hour for the RNA to peak, we're looking for the phosphorylation of that protein, so we want to kill the animal as soon as the animal finishes the REM episode, okay? So immediately, because we know from Lisman work that it takes about two seconds for the, the kinase to be phosphorylated. And, but but the, otherwise the experiment is the same, okay? And what we found so we looked for phosphorylation of chem kinase 2. We also looked for ZIF because we said, well, if ZIF is increased, if the RNA is increased 30 minutes later, the protein cannot be increased two seconds later. Okay? So this is a control in this case. And what we found is that, indeed, the phosphorylation of, of chem kinase 2 follows this U pattern, so it decreases during slow wave and increases during REM in the exposed group, animals that were exposed to the novel objects, but not in the control group and not for ZIF and not for other uh, molecules as well. Very quickly, Savino, one minute. One minute? Okay, thanks. Uh, we also decided to model this. Uh, we, we fed uh, spikes of, of 
of actual uh, hippocampal neurons of a rat to, to different networks. And to make a very long story short, it was just published last week, if you don't model LTP in your system, memories basically get to be erased. You forget, you forget, okay? So sleep is very good to forget if there's nothing, if there's no LTP tagging of those synapses. But if you add LTP to the system, you don't just strengthen the memory, you actually change the memory. So all you need to account for creativity during sleep, which is a, a psychological finding, is to assume that there is LTP in the homeostatic network. Um, I don't think I have time for this. This is more evidence supporting migration from the hippocampus to the cortex uh, during REM sleep. Uh, the same here, you see late after four hours of free sleep, 28 episodes of sleep, you have high expression in the cortex and not in the hippocampus. And uh, Sabine, Sabine is going to get angry with me. I just want to finish by saying what, what we are pursuing is the notion that a systemic property, which is the migration or propagation or transfer or whatever word you want to use of memories from hippocampus to the cortex, is actually due to a molecular property. And how would that go? Remember that ZIF has a, an enterograde effect because it will couple the changes that happen at the dendritic level to changes that occur hours later at the axonal level. If you assume that, imagine we start with this circuit here, something interesting happens and gene expression occurs that is, for example, involves ZIF to 68. Some hours later, you're going to have an increase in the synaptic strength downstream of that activation. And then the animal goes to sleep, reverberates the memory, and because this is now stronger, you now involve this other neuron. And then when it goes to REM sleep, you now get reinduction of the gene in that nucleus, and you get the picture because ZIF couples calcium entry at the dendritic level to axonal changes hours later, every time the animal goes through a, a sleep cycle, you should be pushing those synaptic changes further downstream. So going to the entorhinal cortex and then going to the cortex. Uh, if this is true, what, what, what the evidence we have is that both hippocampus and cortex have what we call plasticity waves when you give novel stimulation. So you have entry of calcium, you have changes in firing rates, you have changes in synchronicity, and you have changes in all this molecular machinery. But in the hippocampus, those are attenuated. In the cortex, they persist. So the model, and this is the final slide, the model that we are working on is that when you acquire memories, both hippocampus and cortex are engaged, but these synaptic changes that are new, they are not renewed in the hippocampus, they age while in the cortex they get to be renewed and propagated. So after some time, the hippocampus is free to receive new memories while the cortex is holding the memories that we have for decades. And thank you very much for all the different fun agencies. Thank you. It's time to finish uh, this symposium in which we did have very important scientific work being described, uh, but most importantly, uh, projecting into the future new collaborations, uh, continual coll ongoing collaborations, doing science through formation of human research and direct to the society, which I think is our mission actually. So thank you very much for all, and I do hope that we will have other symposia like this in order to improve more and more science for health. Thank you very much.